Thomas. How are you enjoying the course so far? Yeah, I think it's good. Remind me, why did you decide to study sports science? Didn't you want to be a professional athlete when you were at school? Yeah, that was my goal, and all my classmates assumed I would achieve it. They thought I was brilliant. That must have been a nice feeling. Hmm, I thought I could win anything. There was no one who could run faster than me. Exactly. So what happened? Did your mum and dad want you to be more academic? Not at all. Perhaps they should have pushed me harder, though. What do you mean? I think I should have practiced more. What makes you say that? Well, I went out to Kenya for a couple of weeks to train. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. I was chosen to go there out of loads of kids and run with some of the top teenage athletes in the world, and I was so calm about it. I just kept thinking how fortunate I was. What a great chance this was! Everyone back home was so proud of me. But once we started competing, I very quickly realised I wasn't good enough.、Mm, that must have been a huge shock. I thought this can't be happening. I was used to winning. I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. I'm over it now, and I think it's much better to do a university course. And this one has such a variety of sports-related areas. It's going to be good. Oh, I agree. I chose it because of that. So, Jiang, have you thought of any ideas for the discussion session next week on technology and sport? We have to cover more than one sport, don't we? Yeah. You know, we always think technology is about the future, but we could gather some ideas about past developments in sport. Look at early types of equipment, perhaps.、Uh, I remember reading something about table tennis bats once. How they ended up being covered with pimpled rubber. Because they were just wooden at first, I'd imagine. Yeah, in about the 1920s, a factory was making rolls of the rubber in bulk to something like horse harnesses. <laughs> really? Yeah, and someone realised that it would make a perfect covering for the wooden bats. So, what about cricket? That's had a few innovative changes. Maybe the pads they wear on their legs. I don't think they've changed much, but I'm just looking on the internet, and it says that when the first cricket helmet came in in 1978, the Australian batsman who first wore it was booed and jeered by people watching because it was so ugly. Oh, wow! Players have to protect themselves from getting hurt. I mean, everyone wears one now. Hmm. Unlike the cycle helmet. Well, unless you're a professional. But you're right. Many ordinary bikers don't wear a helmet. Hey, look at these pictures of original helmet designs. This one looks like an upside-down bowl. <laughs> Yet the woman's laughing. <laughs> She's so proud to be wearing it. It says serious cyclists ended up with wet hair from all the hard exercise. I guess that's why they have large air vents in them now, so that the skin can breathe more easily. Okay, so we've done helmets. What about golf balls, or better still, golf clubs? They've changed a lot. Yeah, I remember my great grandfather telling me that because a club was made entirely of wood, it would easily break, and players had to get another. There's no wood at all in them now, is there? No, they're much more powerful. The same must be true of hockey sticks. Think so because players still use wooden sticks today.、Hmm. What it does say here, though, is that when the game started, you had to produce a stick yourself. I guess they just weren't being manufactured. So, one more perhaps. What about football? Well, I know the first balls were made of animal skin. Yeah, they covered them with pieces of leather that were stitched together, but. The balls let in water when it rained. Oh, that would have made them much heavier. That's right. You can imagine the damage to players' necks when the ball was headed. Oh, how painful that must have been. Yeah. Well, I think we can put together some useful ideas. Hello, everyone. Today we're going to look at another natural food product, and that's 
Maple syrup. What is this exactly? Well, maple syrup looks rather like clear honey, but it's not made by bees. It's produced from the plant fluid or sap inside the maple tree, and that makes maple syrup a very natural product. Maple syrup is a thick, golden, sweet-tasting liquid that can be bought in bottles or jars and poured onto foods such as waffles and ice cream, or used in the baking of cakes and pastries. It contains no preservatives or added ingredients, and it provides a healthy alternative to refined sugar. Let's just talk a bit about the maple tree itself. Which is where maple syrup comes from. So, there are many species of maple tree, and they'll grow without fertilizer in areas where there's plenty of moisture in the soil. However, they'll only do this if another important criterion is fulfilled, which is that they must have full or partial sun exposure during the day and very cool nights. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. There are only certain parts of the world that provide all these conditions. One is Canada, and by that I mean all parts of Canada. And the other is the northeastern states of North America. In these areas, the climate suits the trees perfectly. In fact, Canada produces over two thirds of the world's maple syrup, which is why the five-pointed maple leaf. Is a Canadian symbol and has featured on the flag since 1964. So, how did maple syrup production begin? Well, long before Europeans settled in these parts of the world, the indigenous communities had started producing maple sugar. They bored holes in the trunks of maple trees and used containers made of tree bark to collect the liquid sap as it poured out. As they were unable to keep the liquid for any length of time, they didn't have storage facilities in those days. They boiled the liquid by placing pieces of rock that had become scorching hot from the sun into the sap. They did this until it turned into sugar, and they were then able to use this to sweeten their food and drinks. Since that time, improvements have been made to the process. But it has changed very little overall. So, let's look at the production of maple syrup today. Clearly, the maple forests are a valuable resource in many Canadian and North American communities. The trees have to be well looked after, and they cannot be used to make syrup until the trunks reach a diameter of around 25 centimeters. This can take anything up to 40 years. As I've already mentioned, maple trees need the right conditions to grow and also to produce sap. Why is this? Well, what happens is that during a cold night, the tree absorbs water from the soil, and that rises through the tree's vascular system. But then, in the warmer daytime, the change in temperature causes the water to be pushed back down to the bottom of the tree. This continual movement up and down leads to the formation of the sap needed for maple syrup production. When the tree is ready, it can be tapped, and this involves drilling a small hole into the trunk and inserting a tube into it that ends in a bucket. The trees can often take several taps. Though the workers take care not to cause any damage to the healthy growth of the tree itself, the sap that comes out of the trees consists of 98% water and 2% sugar and other nutrients. It has to be boiled so that much of that water evaporates, and this process has to take place immediately using what are called evaporators. These are basically extremely large pans. The sap is poured into these. A fire is built, and the pans are then heated until the sap boils. As it does this, the water evaporates and the syrup begins to form. 
The evaporation process creates large quantities of steam, and the sap becomes thicker and denser. And at just the right moment, when the sap is thick enough to be called maple syrup, the worker removes it from the heat. After this process, something called sugar sand has to be filtered out, as this builds up during the boiling and gives the syrup a cloudy appearance and a slightly gritty taste. Once this has been done, the syrup is ready to be packaged so that it can be used for a whole variety of products. It takes 40 liters of sap to produce one liter of maple syrup, so you can get an idea of how much is needed. So that's the basic process. In places like this. Hello, children's engineering workshops. Oh, hello. I wanted some information about the workshops in the school holidays. Sure. I have two daughters who are interested. The younger one's Lydia. She's four. Do you take children as young as that? Yes. Our tiny engineers workshop is for four to five-year-olds. What sorts of activities do they do? All sorts. For example. They work together to design a special cover that goes round an egg, so that when it's inside, they can drop it from a height and it doesn't break. Well, sometimes it does break, but that's part of the fun. Right. And Lydia loves building things. Is there any opportunity for her to do that? Well, they have a competition to see who can make the highest tower. You'd be amazed how high they can go. Right. But they're learning all the time, as well as having fun. For example, one thing they do is to design and build a car that's attached to a balloon, and the force of the air in that actually powers the car and makes it move along. They go really fast too. Okay, well, all this sounds perfect. Now, Carly, that's my older daughter, has just had her seventh birthday. So presumably she'd be in a different group. Yes, she'd be in the junior engineers. That's for children from six to eight. And do they do the same sorts of activities? Some are the same, but a bit more advanced. So they work out how to build model vehicles, things like cars and trucks, but also how to construct animals using the same sorts of material and technique. And then they learn how they can program them and make them move. So they learn a bit of coding. They do. They pick it up really quickly. We're there to help if they need it, but they learn from one another too. Right. And do they have competitions too? Yes. With the junior engineers, it's to use recycled materials like card and wood to build a bridge. And the longest one gets a prize. That sounds fun. I wouldn't mind doing that myself. Then they have something a bit different, which is to think up an idea for a five-minute movie and then film it using special animation software. You'd be amazed what they come up with. And of course, that's something they can put on their phone and take home to show all their friends. Exactly. And then they also build a robot in the shape of a human, and they decorate it and program it so that it can move its arms and legs. Perfect. So, is it the same price as the tiny engineers? It's just a bit more, fifty pounds for the five weeks. And are the classes on a Monday too? They used to be, but we found it didn't give our staff enough time to clear up after the first workshop. So we moved them to Wednesdays. The classes are held in the morning from ten to eleven. Okay, that's better for me actually. And what about the location? Where exactly are the workshops held? They're in Building Ten A. There's a big sign on the door. You can't miss it, and that's in Fradston Industrial Estate. Sorry. Fradston. That's F R A D. S T O N E, and that's in Grassford, isn't it? Yes, 
Up past the station. And will I have any parking problems there? No, there's always plenty available. So, would you like to enrol Lydia and Carly now? Okay. So, can I have your phone name?